Oh, boy. I'm drawing a blank. Here. Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 76, 2020 questions, our January 2020 AMA episode. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game noy hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Tonight we are asking, wow, I'm off. We are answering your questions live. Uh, in addition, I got a review of Imhotep, a new dynasty. That's an expansion for Imhotep. And during our weekend review, I got all kinds of games to talk about. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Our first comment is in regard to our five player game list. Cal Stade right, Thod writes We play Cosmic Encounter every year at Gen Con and Origins. It's the only game that is always on the schedule. <laughs> Maybe you're playing with the wrong people. <laughs> we have done Imperial Assault campaigns with four a couple of times. But that should be five. Mm -hmm. Easy pick. Power Grid is great. How about Battlestar Galactica for another heavy game? Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of terraforming, but I think five makes it drag. I am a fan of viticulture with five, as it opens up another space, drags with six. And I also like Kemet with five. Light games, parks, and for sale, dicks it for non-gamers. Concordia is another one I love with four, not so much with five, but I guess if you have five and you have to play something. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Kale Stud. Uh, I'm not going to address all of those. There's some great ones there. Uh, we'll toss those in the uh, the show notes for people to share. I will mention Count Cosmic Encounter because obviously this was in response to a post where I mentioned that I'm not a big fan. I've tried it twice, and I maybe two's not enough. Maybe I should have given it five tries, but I tried it with two different groups. And I would go so far as to say I hated it. I really did not enjoy the game. Definitely not enough to give it another try. I get it. Other people dig it. All the power to them. But I feel, given the game the couple chances I have, it's not for me. Now, Battlestar Galactica is amusing because the reason this post is up and why we're even talking about it is I refreshed it. I grabbed an old post. I went through. I looked at what was there. And I made sure to add some modern games to it. And I deleted some off the list. And one of the ones I deleted was Battlestar Galactica. Now, the reason is the game is now, I don't know, four or five years out of print. It's long out of print. And, like, the lowest price I can find right now is $300. So I felt bad recommending a game that there was no chance anyone was going to be able to pick up. So I ditched that from the list and replaced it with something modern. Now, Terraforming Mars, I played with five this past week. Uh, we'll get to that in the week in review. I don't know. It didn't feel like it dragged for us. Um, I think, basically, though, it really depends on how familiar your players are. If you have five players that know the game and the cards, it seems pretty quick. But then if you toss in drafting, it's slower. I think that one's very group dependent. But yeah, as I mentioned earlier, all the stuff you mentioned, we will throw in the show notes for our fans to check out. All right, next, a comment on our Cthulhu Death May Die review. Paul Kuntortele writes, thanks for the review. However, at the end of the day, kid, would you buy this game? I feel it is a shallow experience, full of minis, full of fast fun, but absolutely no deepness. Am I right? Well, thanks for the comment, Paul. I, while I wouldn't go so far as to call the game shallow, I think there's definitely some depth there. Uh, even if it does lack a campaign, which is my biggest complaint, uh, there's there's enough story there, there's enough depth, and the, the scenarios are different enough from each other. Having played a few different ones, there were very different things you had to do, like looting cultists to find secret codes to go get books was definitely different than putting out fires. I will say, though, I could have backed the Kickstarter. I had that option. It was available to me, and I chose not to after looking into it. The only reason I actually got to play this game was because I received a review copy, so I wouldn't have bought it in the first place. Now, I did have quite a bit of fun playing that review copy, but I'll admit I probably wouldn't go out and buy this one myself. 
at least not at full price. If I could get it probably about half price, I might jump in at that level. But I'll also know I haven't bothered to pick up any of the expansions. I think, uh, just to jump in, I think a lot of it depends on your, your group. Uh, if you yeah. have a group that's really into the Cthulhu mythos uh, and you like mini games, the, the action based mini games, you're probably going to get a lot more out of this game. Yeah. Uh, I don't, again, I wouldn't pick it up, but again, it's not, it was fun, but it's not the sort of game that I go to more often. Yeah. As an example, Ian, who works at the local game store, is a huge Cthulhu fan. He bought it and he does not play video games, he is a role player. Like, he is all about, like, he plays Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing game, and he plays Trail of Cthulhu, and he plays a ton of other stuff, D&D and everything else. Not normally a board gamer. Like, he'll play board games now and then, but he's definitely, that's more the kind of thing he does because he works in a game store and kind of has to know the games. Whereas he picked this up because he loved the fact that he got to play these unique characters, and he loved the feeling of, he, like, his favorite part of it was the fact you were beating up Cthulhu. And it was so different from the usual investigative, especially the role-playing investigation style, that it was fun to do something that you'd never do in a Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Absolutely. All right, well, it seems someone found your post about the troll games from Games Workshop. <laughs> Scotty writes, Hi, please, can you post a link with the music from the Squelch game? Oh, thanks for the comment, Scotty, but I'm sorry to say I could not find a copy of the songs anywhere online to be able to share with you. Now... Back when I wrote the post, I was able to find the Here We Go song on YouTube, but it looks like Games Workshop must have found out about that because they seem to be pulled. I couldn't find a copy of it anywhere. I think at this point, your best bet is find someone who has a copy of the game. Like, I have it, but it's on cassette, and I guess I probably could have brought it up here and played it, but, you know, Twitch might not have liked that much. <laughs> All right, next up, we've got a comment from Michael on our Shadow of the Demon Lord review. Well, I think I'll have to give it a look, but... I've gamed since 74, and my philosophy has always been that players are collectively participating in a story, not telling a story. I find narrative-style games largely weak or silly. Few gamers are good improv improvisational actors, or indeed can manage to come up with unique plot complications that aren't just common tropes. I've played with writers, so have some experience of this. I don't dispute that people having f have fun playing modern-style games, People enjoy being handed money, too, but it doesn't feel like it helps gamers think like the older ones do. Why plan when you can just hand wave plot? Sorry if I came across as granting just a sore spot for me, I guess. You're not sorry. Not at all. Well, thanks for commenting. I do appreciate that, Scotty. Um, sorry if you find you have less and less players at your table as the years go by. Uh, I actually don't mind this comment at first. Until he got to the, the free money part, like, there was some stuff there. Like, come on. Uh, the comment about hand-waving, like, have you actually played a modern role-playing game? Like, it's not up to the players to develop the plot. Well, I guess in some of the... Whatever. I'm all for people playing different ways, but there is no one true way to play. And ragging on modern gaming really isn't a good look. Personally, I think shared responsibility at the table is one of the best things to come from modern gaming. Yeah, I think uh, my my guess would be he may have played with a lot of old school gamers who don't enjoy the modern game, and that's fine. Yeah. They don't have to enjoy it, but he's not getting that modern experience playing with a bunch of people who don't really enjoy or understand the modern games. And to be fair, there are also people out there who should not be uh, running modern games because yeah. they don't have the skill and they haven't uh, you know figured out how to do it yet. Uh, you know, so. There's, there's a lot of different things that go on with the, the modern role-playing game, the story, story games, narr narrative campaigns, mm -hmm. that, uh, that takes, a look, takes a very different uh, style. Adam has a comment on our cooperative kids game article. Quirky Circuits is fun and pretty simple mechanically. It also has adorable miniatures, <laughs> including a cat riding a Roomba. Well, thanks, Adam. Uh, this one's still pretty new. Like, I think late 2019 this came out. I just started hearing buzz. I think it actually might have come out at Gen Con, or at least premiered, and now it's on shelves. I just say it looks cool. I've heard people comparing it to Robo Rally Meets the Mind, which sounds awesome, because I think multiple people are programming the same thing, and they're not allowed to talk to each other. Uh, we'll make sure to toss that in the recommendations, and that's one, if I can get a review copy of someone, I'm going to try to pick it up this year at Origins. So it looks like something my kids will like, and I love Robo Rally. All right, well, let's finish up with a couple of comments on last week's topic, word-based games. First, we have Todd Koch, who writes, Decrypto is better than any on the list. 
All right, thanks, Todd. I haven't played Decrypto myself, but I'll make sure Todd's recommendation ends up in the show notes who, for those who want to check it out. I, my understanding is I think there's a social deduction mechanic part of that game, which is one of the reasons I stayed away from it, yeah. but it's not one I've really tried or stuck out. Yeah, so it's stuck a deduction out, party game word game. Yeah, but I said, once you throw social deduction in there, I'm probably not going to recommend that. It's not going to be on one of my lists. All right. Finally, Shane Ellswood, Ellswood writes, we play upwards occasionally. Mm -hmm. It's similar to Scrabble, but you can stack the letter tiles up to four tiles high to change the words on the Lazy Susan board. And here we go. Lazy Susan board. What? What? Why is that confusing? No, that's like awesome. <laughs> oh, what? yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm like, you said, yeah, thanks. That's, that's exactly it. I'm jealous of that. Like, first off, I'm like, good example of not actually reading the post before commenting, but thanks. Upwards was on our list. But Lazy Susan board, that's awesome. Like, the copy I have definitely has no Lazy Susan board no, no. going for it. Definitely. And I, I, mine's like 70s, 80s. I don't know. It's It was Deanna's, and I married into my copy of Upwards. Yeah, ours, um, ours is 80s, 90s. Yeah. What the interesting part is I thought maybe Shane had the new one, so I asked. I said, oh, do you have this copy? Because the new one has... I thought it was a ridiculous picture on the cover. Well, it's still a ridiculous picture, but it's like a pig with a wig, and a, it, it's all words that stack, and it doesn't look like the old upwards we all grew up with. And I'm like, do you have this? He's like, no, no, mine's from, like, the 80s, so I don't know. Like, I don't know if he has a super old version maybe or they, not. Maybe they came out with a deluxe version at some point. Yeah. I mean, lots like, of yeah. Scrabble has a dozen deluxe versions. La 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 Lazy Susan, though, for upwards. Yeah. Definite thumbs up. All right. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue after the show, at the dub after the double bell for the after show. And some cool stuff, like opening boxes that I don't know what it's in. Uh, so we're not going to spend a lot of time here right now, because that's kind of a waste, because this is an AMA episode, and we're going to be right back in the next segment. So see you in a couple seconds. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight is our first AMA of 2020. We're here to answer your question live. We'll be taking questions from our chat room, the lobby, plus we have a few questions that we received earlier on social media that we can cover. First up, Ryan Peach asks, have you ever given up on a game, walked away from the table, either because you just stopped having fun or couldn't understand what you needed to do to play or some other reason? I know it's happened, but not often, like almost never. I usually play through to the end just to, to get to the end. And I know we, we, pro we, Profess this on the show, that if you're not having a good time, you should stop. I'm always usually one to at least finish off the game the first time. Um, I swear it's happened, and I just can't think of a game. Like, I, I know I played something and walked away. Um, I did quit Cards Against Humanity once, one of the times I played it, where I was like, this isn't actually fun or funny. Uh, that was at a birthday party, so, but I don't know if that really counts. Uh, we, definitely, uh, never... we, we definitely did, un, uh, you know, box up uh, a game of Hogwarts Battle at one point because it was just, there's there's no, you know, we're done here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, definitely, definitely never one I couldn't understand. I, I Actually, to be honest, the first time I tried to play Shafosa, um, I tried to learn the rules and sit down and play it at once, and I gave up, and I went, I'm going to have to go on the internet and try to find an FAQ. And there's another game called Nemesis which was put out by Rackham, the people who used to do the confrontation miniatures. And it was originally released in French. And as far as I can tell, they used Google Translate to produce the English rules. And I literally could not figure out how to play. And there's, I sat down with someone, I think it was probably Eugene, because it's a two-player miniature battle game, very much like a Space Hulk. And we're like, we're going to figure out how to play this. And no, we, we gave up. So yeah, it, it has definitely happened. The more I think about it, yeah, it's happened. Um, Running out of time is most often. Like, we've given up on many games due to running out of time, especially running events at the local game store with them closing at 10 at yeah, night. they close at 10 o'clock at night. Not much you can do. Yeah, 9.30, we've had to kill We've had to kill games many times, but that's not really giving up on a game. Yeah, and I can't think of anything that I've, you know, given up on into the point of I've given up on this and I'm not coming back to it. Um, yeah. Like I said, you know, Hogwarts Battle, you know, we gave up on that game because we were already so far in the hole there was no, there was no pulling out. Uh, yep. But we've been back to it uh, multiple times since. Uh, I can't think of any game where I've just been. No, I'm. 
over. Like there's enough games where I, where I didn't quit, where I finished, and I'm like, I don't need to play that again. That's yeah, definitely one and done, but not, but not we finished. Usually finish, and not. We usually finish the game. He, uh, plus, you never know. There might be something redeeming at the end, right? Like, oh, yeah. the final scoring is actually neat, or he ends up you, you didn't know how to play properly. Yep. All right, next up, uh, another question from Ryan. Is there a game you've chosen to stick with to explore the possibilities despite any rough edges it might have, like a bad rule ba book, a long FAQ, or some other complicated or awkward thing, including maybe our RPGs? I'm back, I'm back to Shafosa, because like I said, the first time I gave up on it, and it was on in my pile of shame for, I think we figured out it was like six or eight years. It was crazy. It was the game in my pile of shame the longest, and last year in January, when we dedicated, we started the no sh less shame, more game challenge. And we were like, I'm going to play everything that's currently in my pile of shame. And I'm going to start with the oldest game. I'm like, I am going to sit down and we are going to learn Shafosa. And it wasn't bad. Like once we figured it out, uh, that rule book was terrible. And it took a while to figure it out. And it took four of us at the table a couple times. Like I remember going here, you read this, see what you think. You read it and see what you think. And you read it and see what you think. And then we kind of voted on what happened and then decided to go with that. We're like, all right, so that's one. Um, RPGs, I've definitely done it with, uh, I tried to run, uh, the, one of the worst, most famous ones, World of Cinnabar. So I, we took the time to make characters and tried to play World of Cinnabar, but that was more for bragging rights. So I can tell people that I've actually ran World of Cinnabar. <laughs> so that was one we stuck through, but I wouldn't say we had fun or, or anything. Uh, the Masters of the Universe, you can just read our review. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say any further, but yeah, we stuck with it. We explored the possibilities. There weren't very many, lots of rough edges, and we gave up on it. Um, Fastest Star Trek, that one's got some some rough rules for RPGs. Um, that's that's the ones off the top of my head. There may be more. All right, uh, Zanister asks, what's the best game you've played with the worst components and the worst game with the best components? Uh, that's That might take me a bit to think about. <laughs> What had the worst component? I know I played games with like really boring, useless components, but I'm trying to think of what. I man, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I know it's happened. I just can't think of it. I, I, I for me, I think it's interesting. And, and again, I still have to give this game a second chance. I haven't yet. But uh, Wasteland that, Express. Wasteland Express, fantastic components, mm -hmm. great management system. Yeah. I, the game didn't click for me. I just yeah. didn't get it. But man, is it some nice stuff in that yeah, box? Yeah, no, that's a fair one. I, I'm gonna say game with the worst components, primordial soup. You're, you're, I get it. You're supposed to be an amiibo, but you're playing like a, a square or an octagon or a hexagon with a pole on it, and you put little beads on top of it to show like what level you are. And then when you eat things, they shit out. Oh, we're not supposed to use that word. <laughs> poop out. They poop out cubes so like you eat a green cube and you poop two green cubes of, or you poop two cubes of your own color you eat a green cube if you're red and then you poop out two reds and you go around um I, it looks horrible like it, it it is some of the most boring geometric shapes wooden bits on a just big blue board with a grid on it that's supposed to represent the primordial sea and you have like this cool stuff like you can evolve your thing but there's nothing that represents that you just put cards in front of you the card art is is childish at best like it just that game could use an upgrade. So there, I'm, I'm going to say, and it's a fantastic game. So I'm going for like, like that's a top 10 game. I love that game. So that's one of the best games I've ever played. And the components in that are pretty bad. Uh, similarly, and kind of in the same vein, Dominant Species. So here you have this game about evolving your arachnids, or you could be the hominids, or you could be, or no hominids. There's, um, I'm trying to think of what monkeys are called. Orangutans, whatever. <laughs> drawn a blank on on english today not game names or you can be the avians or you can be the reptiles or whatever the mammals i think it might be is what the monkeys are but again all your animals are just represented by cubes and your dominance in a region is just a big wooden cone and it shows look the monkeys own this area with a big cone in your color like it just like the rest of the board's okay it just it looks like Catan with cones and cubes on it that could use like there's companies out there that make little wooden meeple to represent all your little animals and a, and a big one that represents dominance. And the game just looks so much cooler. It looks like you got, you know, Pangea in front of you with all this stuff on there. Yeah. At a certain point, I mean, you can go to Etsy or even board game, the board game geek st store yeah, and sure. upgrade components for pretty much any mm -hmm. game out there. So yeah. to find a, to find a, a, a good game with really bad components is just something you haven't upgraded yet. Really? Yeah. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah. True. 
Now, as for best components, terrible games, there are tons of those. Like, I, there's all the gamified games. Like, going back to the, was the, the Star Wars uh, Return of the Jedi game, which had the sail barge and miniatures to represent all the, the orcs and stuff, but the actual game was a rolling movie. You just push things off. Like, it was well, terrible. I mean, we can go, we can go to the more, mo- or the more recently reviewed uh, Labyrinth. I mean, yeah. fantastic yeah. miniatures. That's a great Everyone yeah, should Labyrinth buy this game and... for the miniatures, and the game isn't a game. Yeah, Labyrinth, the board game. That was that was terrible. Or and I have to assume that the Dark Crystal one's just as bad. Um, for me, I, I'm not a big fan of Scythe, and that's like super overproduced game. But that's not the worst. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> definitely not the worst. Like it's it's definitely people enjoy it. But yeah, prettiest game that's terrible. Labyrinth is probably a good call. You got me beat on that one. But there are tons. Like there's these games that come out with the, the amazing miniatures. There's miniature games, like there's versions of Warhammer I've tried. Like the the Warhammer side games that right. I'm like, oh, so not for me. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. Uh, Jerry Milo Johnson on Facebook wrote, "When the table breaks out in nothing but social interaction, do you go with it as the DM or force them back on task?" All right. The one problem with this question is I don't know if they mean in game social interaction or not. So is this your? I think I think I I I remember the question. I did see this question on Facebook. To me, it felt like they were talking about not in game. See, yeah, that's what I'm thinking, right? Like if you're sitting there and you're supposed to be going in the dungeon and killing orcs, and you're talking about what was on TV last week and what you had for pizza and the latest episode of insert whatever popular show here, that that can be a problem. But really. I, almost all these RPG questions are going to be based on your group. It totally depends on the vibe of your group. If you're a group that gets together all the time anyway, if you're a group of friends that hung out and you were just at the bar last night or two days ago, you're all having dinner together or at the coffee shop or whatever, then at that point, I don't know if it's necessarily the DM's job, it's someone's job, whoever the, the host is, to get everyone on track. Like, you can talk about this stuff later. But then if you're a group of friends and you live in four different cities two hours apart and you never see each other, and you get together to game and you end up just talking to each other and catching up and having a good time? Maybe not. So I, I don't have a definitive answer for this. It really depends on your group. In general, this kind of goes back to my uh, players skipping out on game night, may, not making game night. You made a commitment to game. And you should game. You should try to game. You should try to do it. Remind everyone, hey, we're here to play a game. Remember three weeks ago we had session zero and said we're going to get together every Tuesday and we're going to play? Well, we're going to play. And actually starting the game and getting to the game and stuff like this, out of game talk, is something that should be part of that social contract, verbal or not. I, I personally would push towards trying to get people back on track. Right. Now, if we're talking about in-game, again, very group dependent. It depends on the game I'm playing. If I'm playing Dungeon Dragons 4th Edition and we're about to siege a castle and everyone's just sitting outside talking to the first guard they meet, I'm going to get a little frustrated. But if it's at the end of the dungeon adventure and they just got back to town and they're meeting up with their long lost brother and the innkeep that they've known since the first adventure and someone's whatever, go for it, right? Like I have had that D and D session where you sit down and you do the the, the wow we role played so much we didn't even roll a die and you're all, it's almost a neat thing sometimes. And there are people out there who will claim you didn't play D and D then. Ah, pff, you whatever. can go play with uh, Mister. <laughs> I've been playing since 1974. Yep. Um, I, I personally think, it, again, you judge the group. I have no problem with people getting into social interaction in game in an RPG. It is an RPG. You may want to have, now this is the thing. This is the, the big boy pants moment. Put the big boy pants on, big person pants, sorry, big person pants on and be like, look, guys, do we want to keep doing the social interaction because I'm good with it? But I was really hoping we could get to this part of the adventure. It's up to you. Meta game it, right? Like ask. There's no, you don't, breaking immersion in a role playing game doesn't ruin the game. All right, uh, another one. Uh, now, Kenyon Burgess uh, uh, says this would be a good opportunity to discuss delays in gaming <laughs> plastic pieces in miniature shipments coming over from China due to the flu tariffs or flu and tariffs, I guess. They, you know, they got, we, got a, we got a multiplicity of problems happening right yeah. now. Uh, so supposedly all the board game tariffs because of uh, the U.S. president were, are all on pause. None of that happened or it may still happen, but there are no delays to any board game shipments for that. Um, there's no rising costs. Uh, every publisher I have listened to when I listen to enough podcasts put out by publishers have guaranteed their prices will go up. So if the U.S. does start taxing China for these imports on toys and games, uh, do the plastics, because a lot of our games count as that now, although they'll, they'll get lumped in, so even the wooden Rio Grande games will get covered too. 
Well, I think most of those are published in Germany. But anyway, um, they were, prices are going to go up. So if it happens, they are going to go up. Flu tariffs I haven't heard about. I'm assuming this has to do with the coronavirus. Well, I, don't, I don't think it's flu tariffs. I think it's the flu or tariffs. I mean, okay, I think shipments coming from uh, China could get held up because if the population of China, the working yes. population of China is uh, well, unable is to that. go to work so, for... So one of the things is I don't think you have to worry about getting the flu from anything from China. I really, I'm, I'm pretty sure the stuff can't survive for that many days on a ship, but maybe not. I don't know if that'll have a big impact, but yes, production in China right now is terrible. Uh, they're, they're companies are not going to be able to keep up. So there are going to be delays. It's, it's going to happen. The thing, the secret here is don't get mad at the Kickstarter, the guy who got your $3, who launched a Kickstarter that made $1,000 and it's the first $1,000 ever made in the gaming industry. Don't go yell at him because his Kickstarter is delayed. It's not under their hands. Same thing, don't go to Queen Games and do the same. And don't go to Queen Games and be really mad that you're not getting your copy of whatever Copenhagen the right and roll and right. Like, it, these are unavoidable things that are part of production and publishing. Like, now, when the person who created the Kickstarter doesn't realize that Chinese New Year means everything's delayed for two weeks, then you can be upset. Yeah. But when it's something like this, just don't well, take and it part of the, And part of the problem it. that's really hitting this industry right now is we had the Chinese New Year, but that yes. Chinese New Year is essentially being extended yes. for an indeterminate period of time mm. because... There's a nasty virus that is massively impacting the population. Yeah. So. So yeah, there's gonna be there's gonna be delays through that. Um, there might be price increases. Like I said, just don't take it out on the wrong people. Just uh, accept it. It's it's a yeah. something happened. It's it's a game. You'll get it eventually. Yep. All right. Well, Michael Hutchinson writes, "How do you deal with the gamer that has a few too many drinks, but you really like that person?" I, you know what? I really like that person. It's not an excuse for any bad behavior. Not nowadays. Grow up. Um, someone has a few too many drinks. You ask them to stop playing. It's like, hey, it's time to time to go home. You've had enough. It's time to uh, it's time to buck up. You know what? You're no longer welcome at our like, hey, here, have your drinks. Go sit over there. Do your own thing. Go play video games. Do whatever. Stop bothering us while we're trying to play games. Um, go home. Don't drive home. Get them. Call them a cab. Drive them home. Whatever it takes send them to bed. Like I said, just don't let it interfere with the rest of the game night. If it happens to be that it doesn't interfere, you call the game, call the night, be like, hey, it's time to go home. We were having a good time, but you know what? It's getting late. You can be semi-polite about it. If the person doesn't take it well, well, that's dealing with a drunk person, which is way beyond anything okay. I'm going to get into. Yep. All right. Uh, Ryan in the chat room asks, what are your favorite RPG live plays? Edited be more like audio dramas and less like a live raw feed. All right. I don't do a lot of uh, actual plays. It's not really my jam. Uh, I don't know what it is. I, I mainly, I get, I want to yell at the DMs or the players. <laughs> like I listen to them and I'm just like, no, why did you do that? Especially like when the DMs do things like call for die rolls for things that like, I know if the person fails, it's just the, the story stops. So why'd you even call for a die roll? Or, or I get frustrated with players. What the hell's this spell do again? And I'm like, you've asked that every episode. So I have a hard time listening to them, but I do like ones where they cut all that stuff out, right? And produce it more like an audio drama. Uh, the one I had the most enjoyment with was Streets of Avalon, which was the Wednesday evening podcast All-Stars people from the uh, gem crew playing with the people from gaming and BS um, with Andy running it. So she, from SAS geek. So like a whole, a bunch of podcasts and people I dig all got together and did an actual play, right? Knights of the night was another podcast that was involved in that. And they did this D and D actual play all set in a city with this really interesting plot with this box. And it introduced people to the world of Avalon, which interestingly enough, when they first played was just a thing but then they've launched a Kickstarter since, and you can now buy a source book for Worlds of Avalon. So they actually re-released the audio drama. I thought that was really well done. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, Tracy Barnett has done some really interesting... I, I, they don't quite get the audio drama, but they're still very edited actual plays. And I've enjoyed listening to some of their actual plays. Um, those are the main the main ones I've listened to. Most of, most of the stuff I listen to, I guess, is indie stuff. There, there was a D&D &D one years ago, but to be honest, I don't even remember the name of it because it's been so long since I listened to it. They, they, I, their first episode was the was an orc was at a fair for the first time and they talked too much about funnel cakes. But it went on to be a really good plot. But I totally don't remember what the name of that show was. Yeah, the only the only real live play I've ever even bothered listening to was Nerd Poker, um, and it really wasn't 
audio drama it up. They 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 sort of kept it all in there. That was just a bunch of comedians in L.A. playing. Yeah. Uh, uh, See, I did used to listen to The Walking Eye, which was the exact opposite. The Walking Eye was, here, there's a mic on the table. <laughs> and I found it interesting because what I listened to them for was to learn the system. So I would hear their foibles. I would hear them, wait, do you roll this? No, do you do that? Oh, wait, do you do this? And then them getting it as it went on. So I listened to them. They did a whole thing with the Avengers and the Marvel Super Marvel Heroic Role Playing Game from Margaret Rios Productions. And I really enjoyed listening to that because I had a hard time getting Marvel to click and listening to them play it. The system made a lot more sense to me. Um, what do we have here? Sean Kilgore or Gil Gilgore asks, which game has the most replayability without an expansion? Oh wow, that's <laughs> there's every RPG, but I'm sure he's talking about board games. You don't tend to call RPG books expansions. <laughs> uh, probably <laughs> this sounds ridiculous because it's expensive, but like Gloomhaven, how many flipping hours of play do you have in that game? And then, like, once you finish the campaign, you can go back and do all the side quests. And even that, you could still go through with another party. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if and it's And you can do the randoms. Yeah, yeah, and you can do random dungeons forever. Like, till the end of time, you can and, just keep doing random dungeons. And I mean, like, even... I guess it has an end. Like, yeah. there's probably other games. Like, like, people still play chess, right? <laughs> people still play Go. Like, people love that. But to me, I don't want to play those that many times. Yeah, I, I find at this point, um, we're getting into a, a strange little thing where at, at, a, at a certain point something like chess or go almost become closer to sport than game yeah. they're games True. No, it but is. It's, it's a it's a competition sport competition yeah. yeah so so i move though i move chess and go at this point over towards uh towards sport Mario, you can play them casually right but but it, it's definitely a more well, like to me, the, the duke would be over there too like I, I'm not sick of the Duke yet. I played it forever, and I, I like you can keep playing it forever. And every game could be different for yep. forever because there's enough different tile possibilities. It's possible you'll never see all the combinations. But to me, I don't know. For some reason, that's in a different spot to me than this. Yeah. So maybe it fits. Maybe maybe the Duke should be my game with the most replayability. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. Think. I mean, I play Can't Stop. Uh, you know, almost a yeah. game a day recently. <laughs> uh, that one I, I can't. Can't Stop doesn't interest me enough to have the most replayability. So yeah, Gloomy. I'm trying to think of something cheaper. Um, well, again, know. though, when you look at Gloomhaven, again, you look at that, even the a full MSRP, play. 150 bucks or so, you look at the number of plays, you look at the price per play of that game, yeah. and it becomes really cheap, really fast, as long as you've got the people to play it. But like, there's, like, I love Shogun and Wallenstein. I don't know if I'll ever get sick of those. And again, every game is going to play different. You're never going to get the same fall from the cube tower, especially when you're not using the starting setups. Everyone's going to start in different provinces. There's people who play Risk professionally, like the almost any game, but like the most replayability. I, I, what I'm trying to think of, you know what it is? Okay, here's where my thought went from Sean's question, is what game is going to give me the most unique experiences? which is why I thought of Gloomhaven. There's going to be so many different modules with different characters, buying different equipment and playing differently. Whereas the Duke kind of feels the same. Chess is definitely, you don't get a lot of new experiences. You yeah. play chess, you play chess. So I'm thinking for game with the most replayability with, for, like even Catan, right? You can play, I, I know people who love Catan and played it two, three, four hundred times, but you don't get anything new out of Catan when you play it for the third, 30th time probably. <laughs> Possibly the fifth time you don't get anything new out of Catan. Whereas, like, a Gloomhaven, you're going to keep getting new stuff out of that. Uh, if, plus, if there's anything, I'm trying to think of something where you make your own stories. There's probably something like that, like Rory Story Cubes, right? They're being the really basic version, but I'm thinking there's got to be a more modern, more involved one. Um, there's one people are going nuts for right now, and I'm drawing a complete blank. It's technically an RPG, but it's sold in a box. It's what uh, Phil Vecchione's group is playing right now. Yeah, Ryan in the in the chat room mentions uh, TI four. See TI four again. Eventually, you're gonna you're gonna have seen all the technology. It's still though, like with the number of different races, you're, it's gonna take you forever to see it all. Right. I could I could see that. <laughs> Terra Mystica. Uh, um... Yeah. Terra Mystica. I still haven't played all the races. Yep. I'm close. I'm close. I don't know how the what is there thirteen different ones. I played more than thirteen times. So. 12 races? 12? It's either 12 or 16. All right. Uh, what do we have here? Brian, our uh, longtime fan, Brian, comes up with uh, a longer question here, but I'm going to distill this down a little bit. Yeah. Talking about thematic grouping of games. Okay. We all played Clue when we were younger. What are some mystery-themed games that are actually good? 
Uh, there's a few out there. There's not a lot. Like, there's all the exit games, right? There's the escape room games. I don't know if you consider those mystery themed games. They're puzzles. That's what I'm thinking. Of. Yeah, I'm thinking of it as a puzzle. Egg, egg, so exit rooms are, are very puzzle like to me more yeah. than like, more than board game, especially with yeah, the, the one one time use. It's a yeah. There's those. Um, there's Mysterium, which is a co one versus many, where one player is a ghost giving clues to the other players trying to solve a murder. Um, there's all the modern detective games. There are a ton of these. Um, like Sean was talking when we were talking Nitwick last week about the things on the map. There's a bunch. There's detective murder in Hong Kong. There's a whole series of these detective games. There's also the Sherlock Holmes games, and there's a bunch of different series of the Sherlock Holmes games, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and some other ones. Um, there's a big one that was hot at Gen Con. It's not a type of game that I've really had much experience with personally, and I don't know why. Like, I, it just doesn't, I don't know, solving a mystery doesn't sound all that exciting to me. Yeah, uh, I've, then of I've never even been the, a Sherlock Holmes reader myself. It's just yeah. not been... Uh... Then, of course, there's the the LARP ones. At, at least I'll call, I call them LARPs, basically, but all the how to host a, a murder. Those right. are definitely mysteries where you get a group of people together for a, a dinner or whatever, and you play through a set scenario and try to figure out who did it. There's definitely modern versions of Clue, really. Yeah. How many different, you know, v VCR games were there that were that? Yeah, that were there were basically a bunch of those that too. that game. Yep. That was a whole genre of games that tanked horribly yep. because, well, the technology went away. But there were so many VCR games, and, and they were almost all mystery. Yeah. Yeah, there were quite a few of those. And not because it was Nightmare and Atmosphere are the two of them more popular. I don't even know if those were mysteries. I never played any of those. I hear, I hear the Star Trek one was pretty good, but I don't think it's actually a... Uh, I don't think it's actually a mystery. How to Host a Murder, I remember those. There were a bunch of those. Yeah. I'm drawing a blank. I, 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 what, during these AMAs, I try not to actually pull up Google or, <laughs> or crap board game geek. But like I said, mysteries are definitely not my normal jam. So th they're out there. There are quite a few. Uh, I think it's probably a category on board game geek, or at least a tag where you can sort by tag. And I'm sure if you Google best mystery games, a bunch will come up. There's definitely better stuff than Clue. Right. Like I had more fun with what was that game that we did the prototype of that looked like a Clue board. Oh yeah. Um... Oh, oh man! Yeah, the name's escaping me. Cypress Legacy. There you go. Uh, that, that's there was no mystery to actually solve there. But I mean, yeah, Betrayal House on the Hill is probably the best rated. That's a mystery. I I don't think that one's a mystery. That's that's a one versus many. You play through half the game, and then all of a sudden something horrible happens, and you have to try to do it. I don't see that as a mystery game. That one I've played. Okay. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, as uh, Mysterium is uh yeah, best for kids. Uh. We're sort of looking at some other options here. Uh, Deluxe Baker Street game is, I guess, a multi-adventure. Yeah, so that's one of the Sherlock Holmes games. Uh, Scotland Yard would uh, come for deduction. Uh, see, that's not that's one versus many again, right? One player's trying to escape, and the other players are trying to catch him. To me, there's no mystery to be solved. That's just right. try to outwit. Like I said, it's, it's hard, right? Deduct well, depends. What and they call letters, letters from Whitechapel best one versus many. Yeah, that's the one that almost all of them are based on. Right. Uh, there's there's nuns on a run if you want to oh, kids apparently versus... there's something uh the, the dead bolt mystery society is a monthly mystery so huh. it's a it's a subscription mystery game series all right dead bolt mystery society interesting that one i don't know yeah no. yeah sorry brian i don't have a lot of strong recommendations if i we might do some of these as full topics if i do them as full topics i'll do the research and I'm pretty sure we can pull you up like the top 10 mystery games according to the internet. <laughs> of course, you could probably Google that yourself. They they kept, they gave us the best uh, budget one is uh, Mystery Board Game The Secret Door by Family Pastimes. Okay, then. Which is, uh, yeah, I mean, 20 bucks. Mystery House is one I'm trying to get a review copy of. Okay. That's a game where the box is the board. Okay. And you open it up and you put the rooms inside the house and then you close it up. And then you have to do stuff like look through the windows to try to solve something sounds really unique that's why i wanted to review it uh they just won the 2020 toy of the year i think it's doctor toy it's one of the toy of the year rewards not spiel the whatever but right. like something something north american and they put an announcement saying hey we won and i'm like oh i'm gonna this is a press release and i can reply to this <laughs> and i actually asked them i'm like here i really want to show this off because it sounds really unique and i like unique games i like right. games that do something new and like i said part of the game is looking through the windows and see if you can see different things Sounds really neat. I think it's just called Mystery House. 
Again, I'm trying not to Google. <laughs> um, Michael Hutchinson asks, have you been to a gaming convention and what were your pros versus cons of going to gaming conventions? I think we're definitely on the pro side overall, but overall. that's not to say there aren't cons to going yeah. to a con. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely pro Benda. Not many. I definitely don't attend a lot of gaming conventions, but uh, I try to go to two to three a year. We'll see see if that happens this year. Best thing about going to a con is you're with your people. I love the vibe of a con. I like the feeling that everyone around me has something in common with me, and everyone's on the same page. And everyone, most people, I should say, you have people, outliers. But in general, everyone's there to game and to have a good time. They know you're there to game and have a time. And no matter where you are, whether it's in the washroom, so talking to people in the washroom could be weird, or at the gaming table, you, you could be talking, right? Like, oh, what'd you play that was so good today? Oh, what are you playing tomorrow? What are you doing? What's your favorite game you've seen? Like, there's just that, that common ground over the entire con that I really dig. I, I love that vibe. That's one of my favorite parts. Uh, the next thing is to be able to see stuff and tr touch it and try it without spending money first it it's the place where i get to see and try new games that includes rpgs as well like i would never have i i, I don't own fake games because i don't get it but now i played some and i had never bought a power by the apocalypse game but i got to try one and then went and bought one or i was really curious about tales from the loop but didn't want to buy a 90 dollars book without playing it same thing for board games board games obviously right like all the games that come out at origins and everything else yeah, no, for me, it's especially, it's, uh, you know, aside from the people, and people really is a big deal, uh, but it's getting game, getting a chance to play that game that you will never play at home, you know? I don't know anyone who's going to run the worldwide wrestling game, you know? Yeah. And so my chance to get that is by going to cons. Uh, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, it's probably that's the place where you're going to get a chance to play a lot of different games yeah. you've never played, whether it's at the board game uh, library or in uh -huh. an RPG game, you know, the, you've just got so much content available to you yes. that you're not going to be able to have in your library behind you. No, very true. And I know a lot of people that go to cons because they don't have local gamers. Windsor has a fantastic gaming community. I, maybe I had something to do with that. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it would have grown on its own. But we have a great group. I have a Facebook group where we publish events that has over 600 members. Windsor's no Toronto. We're not a big city. 600 people of not at your beck and call but to be able to go hey who wants to play this tonight right that's fantastic yeah. not everyone has that right i know a lot of people that go to origins just to spend in my opinion way too much money for that boardroom thing to meet up with their fellow gamers that they meet up with every year at origins and just that group of four just sit and play games together all weekend right which is awesome if that that's your jam do it that's that's fantastic so there's a definitely a big pro to access to games and gamers access to games and gamers probably sums up both of what we just said all in a little bit more succinctly yeah. now cons um the biggest one that i really flip and hate i get sick all the time i have a compromised immune system due to uh physical problems i have medical problems i have i i don't think i can go to a con and come home not sick it just it, and it lasts and lingers. Con cred sucks. Like, I try. I wash my hands. I try. I got to stop shaking hands. The problem is I, I can't. I was just raised that's what you do. And I have a firm handshake because that's what you're supposed to do. Like, I just, I was raised with that, right? That was a big thing my dad instilled in me that I, I can't help it, right? Like, and there are certain people now that I got to know that hugging has now become more of a thing, right? Like, I, I know a lot of huggers, it seems. And it's hard not to, right? Plus, even if you're the most careful, especially playing board games, a big part of board games is touching the same pieces. Like, you can't help it. You're passing cards, you're moving meeple, yeah. you're touching stuff, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the con crud is, is probably my biggest hatred of going to cons is that week after cons. Like, I almost need a week off after every con, which thankfully now I work from home, so I can at least, you know, still work. Well, and one of the big issues and one of the big problems with con crud is, especially if you are out of town seeing a lot of people you haven't seen before, you're going to be going out, you're going to be staying up late, you're going to be playing late because you don't want to stop playing with these people. Yeah. You don't want to stop playing with your friends so you're not getting those six nights, six or more hours yeah. of sleep a night. Mm -hmm. um, who knows what you're eating? Maybe you're eating better, but maybe you're eating too much. Maybe you're not eating enough because you're playing games too much. Maybe you're drinking a little bit too much. Uh, there's a whole lot of ways to be really unhealthy at a con, um, yeah. and it, it's just not hard. Um, I guess your next, and I, and I, I totally agree, you know, it's, you have to fight to avoid the con crud, and depending on your immune system, you yeah. may have more or less luck. I guess the next con would be if you are a person that has social anxiety. Yeah. 
Uh, and there's a lot of us out there. I suffer from it. Uh, I I struggle at the con, uh, at cons as much as I as much as I like them. The the density of people at some cons can really be overwhelming. Um, and and the best solution are well, there's two really. I mean, great cons like Breakout now have quiet rooms where yep. when you do start to feel overwhelmed, you can just go and take a time out, and there's a place for you dedicated for you to to get that recharge. The next thing is, if you can, whenever possible, have a friend there, because a lot of times having that person that you are already totally comfortable with mm -hmm. can act as an anchor uh, and really sort of ground you so that when things are getting a little overwhelming, you can, you know, grab their arm or, you know, squeeze their back mm -hmm. or something, turn, face them, stare in their eyes and block out the people around you and a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and as well, if you can set up a base camp, you know, it, it may not be as large as the one that uh, Jem has established and we, uh, we take part in, but even if you've got just a little corner of an area where you can go and, and hide and, and compress yeah. yourself. This, this is a, that's a pro tip you don't hear often. If you have a large enough group of people you're going to meet up with at the con, like, like five, more than five, pick a spot and have that be the spot everyone returns to. So you're going to go walk the dealer hall for a bit. When you're done, go to that spot. You're going to go play Saddle Run for four hours. When you're done, go to that spot. And that just becomes like the general meetup spot. And like you just pick a spot in the con, right? Somewhere where there happen to be chairs would be nice. But you just pick a spot. And that's a good spot where everyone can just meet up. That's a good spot where you can meet and be like, hey, I'm going to go grab some food. Do you want to grab some food? Stuff like that. Yep. Uh, the, yeah, another con to me for cons is uh, fear of missing out. This covers a huge range of things. One of them. I like I run tabletop gaming deals. I'm a cheap bastard when it comes to buying board games. I will admit it. I I, I now tell other people how to save money buying board games. Buying games at cons is usually not worth it. In my opinion, you don't need to bring the game home and play it that week. E even as a content creator, we say it all the time on the show. We are not all about the new hotness. I don't think anyone needs to be about the new hotness. You are. You don't have to have it then. You're not going to miss out. It doesn't even matter if the mine sold out in three hours. It'll be in game stores in three months. Wingspan, there's still people out there who haven't got it. Another printing will come. It'll come out. You'll be able to get your copy. I don't see it. Now, the only time I can see doing it, again, is if you're a content creator and you're trying to be on the cutting edge, sure, that's a, that's a thing. Plus, if you're meeting up with people to play it there at the con, I can kind of see it, right? Like, there's a hype train. There's a, there's a being part of the event, so I can kind of see it. But make sure you have the disposable income to do that. Like, you have to have the funds. Like, personally, I don't have the disposable income to be able to be part of the group that at the bar after Origins can talk about how we all sat down and played that hot new game and be part of that hype train, or we played the latest adventure or whatever it happens to be. But this also goes to events. There is no way at any con I've been to you can do everything. Like, even Breakout. Breakout's not a big con. You still can't see and do everything. You're not going to get to DM with a play an RPG with every player you want to play. You're not going to get to play every game you want to play in the library. You're not going to get to take part in that LARP and go do the the overnight uh, what did that the world is mine space thing that's yeah. going on. Like, <laughs> like you just can't. And that's a small con, right? Like even at the old Windsor Game Fest, you couldn't play in the Magic tournament and be in my Warhammer tournament at the same time. You're gonna miss out on stuff. Yep. And don't overschedule yourself. Because you are going to miss it, except the fact you're not going to be able to do everything and leave free time, which kind of goes back to Sean's self-care. Yeah. Uh, and it's about another thing, you know, panels. You know, there may be some great panels yeah. out there, but pay attention because a lot of times now on these shows, while it is important to go see panels, because if nobody goes sees a panel, panels are yeah. really boring. <laughs> but as long as some people are there, they are now almost always recording panels for yeah, a so later release as a podcast. So as long as not everyone is ignoring the panel, you'll that still be rough. able to get a lot of that content later. Uh, and it's rough. very rare that, you know, it, everyone will ignore it because generally the, the friends and family and friend yes. and, you know, fans of whoever is talking on the panel will be there no matter what. So, you know, if, I don't know. My, if you have to choose between self time or that game that you may never get to play again or a yeah. panel, the panel is probably going to lose out unless you know it's vital to your specific friend you know if you're a game designer yeah. you might want to spend a little more time at panels i don't know it's, it's hard not to support your friends though if, if it's Absolutely. your friends you know they're not going to get a lot of people go to support them just to be a seat in a chair and show that your support yeah. is part of it but if you know it's like the dice tower like 
they're, they're going to fill the room. They're, like, yeah. they're not going to miss you, right? Yep. So it's kind of a think of it from two ways. Are they going to miss you? Like, are you going to be like a, a, a pillar for them to stand on when you're there? Or are you just going to be another face in the room? If you're just going to be another face in the room, you, you know it's being recorded. There's no reason not to just catch it later. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and the other, I guess the last con I get would be, depending on where what con you're talking about and where you're going, is cost. Well, yeah. Because unfortunately... That's, that's possibly the biggest. <laughs> Con. Unfortunately, uh, unless it's a local con and you know everyone involved, you're going to be traveling somewhere. You're going to yeah. be spending hotel rooms. You're going to be spending entrance for the con. You're going to be spending for every game or panel or whatever at most cons you go to. Uh, breakouts different. Breakouts generally, you know, once you get in, you're you're in. But most cons, you're paying for everything you get. You do on top of paying to get into the con and stay at the con and get to the con. Um, and it's it's very expensive, and you need to weigh in your own life and budget whether or not that expense is worth what you're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, very true. Cost cost is the one that's hitting me the most now. That that's the biggest con to cons that cost money to go to. Yeah, for me that that is definitely the case. At least I'm not getting sick. There you go. But that being said, if you can get there and if you can afford it. They're a fantastic I, way I guess, to enjoy yeah. the game, all the games and all the fun and all the people that make this hobby great. Yeah, I would say overall the pros outweigh the cons for cons. Like I, I, everything negative we said, I still think it's worth it. And I'd still go if I could afford it. I would go to a con every weekend. Like if, like there's family and stuff, right? I obviously can't. I have kids, whatever. But mm -hmm. I'm just saying, like I would go to way more. I, I would definitely hit up more cons. I would do a Dice Tower cruise because that just sounds awesome. But, like, there's a lot of reasons I can't. But, I like, I'd love going to cons. Like, I, I would just love it if my life was a con circuit. And I'm sure I'd get sick of it quick because there are people that that is their life. Yep. <laughs> is is hitting the con circuit. I met a bunch of them at the Windsor Comic Con. And, man, Gil Gerard's looking rough. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, Zanister asks, what would you guys do? I have a copy of Nemesis that is selling on Amazon currently for $299. Would you play it or sell it? Play it. I'm not Neil. <laughs> no, I assume I bought it to play, right? Like, it depends. If someone gave me a copy of Nemesis and I was like, yeah, I don't know, Nemesis, I'd sell it. But, like, assuming I went back to Nemesis Kickstarter, this is the alien board game, quote, unquote. If I went and spent the money to get Nemesis and had a copy and I bought it to play, I would play it. It's just like comic. I buy comic books to read them. I don't buy them because of their resale value. I have friends. I have a friend, Neil who will do that. He'll he'll pre-order a game, he'll buy a game, not just to sell it, but it'll come out and he'll get it, and all of a sudden it'll be short supply. He'll flip it easily. He'll be like, fine, I can buy three copies later, right? So he's very much in that, I can get it later. Well, now, to be honest, in the first place, like I'm going to wait till Nemesis is like 50% off on Amazon before I even consider it, if it actually, if they ever print enough, or I'm just not going to care, because we're now at the stage where there are way too many games that come out, and even if Nemesis is amazing, I doubt it's the best game ever out there. I'll play something else. So no, I would I wouldn't flip it. If I bought it to play, I would play it, no matter what the price. Like maybe if it went for like a, I don't know, a thousand, like I don't, there's probably a limit where I'd be like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Everyone has their price, this. right? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure it would get to a point, but two ninety nine wouldn't. I, I from what I remember, the game probably wasn't under a hundred bucks to get in the first place. All right, that's probably enough for the Q&A. Not shooting. I did see a couple other things in the chat, but we got some other stuff we want to get to today. So we had we had an all gaming topics. We didn't have any Minotaur milk this week, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. Thank you, everyone, in the chat room for asking your questions. For those of you who uh, sent in questions on Facebook, I hope you listen to this and get to hear your answers. I may go back out now that we've talked about it and post my answers on Facebook. I may not, though, just to punish you for not coming to listen. <laughs> All right, if you've got a question for us, you know where to go, right? Head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more, and things are in the works. Things are moving, things are happening, yes. and now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Yeah, there's something we're going to be talking about a bit. you got two days to be on the ground floor. About that. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. If you have, you know what I'm going to be talking about next. 
Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released the week previous. Links to blog posts, new podcast episodes, unboxings, actual plays, anything else we create, we toss in there and send you a link so you don't miss it. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, then we drum roll. <laughs> I promise to get done by the end of January, and we managed to actually stick to that promise. As of today, the Tabletop Bellhop Patreon page has been completely revamped and re-updated and changed and is wonderful and has new graphics. It's done. After you're done listening to the show, head over to the patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and check out our completely revised uh, tier, tier and tier. goal structure. All right, here's a quick summary. It's going to take a bit because we got quite a few tiers. So I'm just going to list off the tiers here and what you get just in case you want to check us out. I think there's going to be some stuff here people should be excited about, people are going to care about. We tried to swap things around to be more about you than us. So the first one is to tip the bellhop. That's our new basic tier. Our old basic tier, you got nothing. Now, for only two bucks, you're going to get behind-the-scenes posts on Patreon. These are blog posts that I write once a week. You're going to have access to our pre-production show notes and access to our Discord channel. We're trying to build a community there. This is half the price Discord access used to be. Our Discord is a great place to interact with us and fans of the show. All right, here's an interesting one. We're calling this tier, I'm just here for the deals. Now, this is brand new. For people who mainly follow me for tabletop gaming deals, this is mainly something that happens on social media. This level gets you on a new mailing list where I'll be sending out notifications of the hottest deals, stealth sales, and online offers before I share them on social media. Get the scoop on the hottest deals. All the other back levels above this tier will also have the option to opt into these emails. All right, hotel guests. This is what we're expecting to be the sweet spot backer level with the most bang for your buck. Uh, the one thing you're going to get is your bonus audio from this year live show, what we're recording right now. If you're listening to the podcast, you have no idea what you're missing out on, how much stuff we cut out. Just last episode was 120, 126, no, an hour and 20 minutes worth of extra audio. We're going to have even more of the day. So uh, this is something where people who are in our chat room get for free. So that's the other thing you can do is come watch us free. But if you're not here in the chat room, you can get this through our hotel guest level. Uh, you're going to get access to patron-only polls. This is something new we're going to start. We're going to run them from time to time. This is going to let you get some input onto what we do next, what we interview, what we do on the show, if you want us to interview different people, or what I'm going to unbox next, or what you want a review of. Backers at this level are going to get five bonus entries in any tabletop bellhop contest and video giveaways. These aren't going to be contests done on Patreon. You're not allowed to do that, actually. They're going to be contests on tabletop bellhop. The next one's going to be a game called Medium, which is in the mail and being shipped, they told me, two to three weeks before it shows up. Finally, if you ask a question, you get bumped to the top of our question pile, max one question a month. We're limiting this last one to just once a month. So one person doesn't feed us with questions and flood us with questions. We want everyone to have a chance to have their questions answered. All right, next, we have a brand new level we're going to call This Chair Is For You. This is for people who want to play games with Deanna, Sean, and I. Uh, this will most likely be online, but you know what? If you're going to be at Origins or uh, Breakout or possibly QQC, we might meet up with you there and sit down and actually play a game in person. Once a month, we hope to be gaming with one of you. Next, we got the Lost and Found level. This is our only physical reward tier. You are going to get something. Twice a year, we're going to send you a gaming mystery package. What's the, in the package will be specially selected and packed by Deanna and she games. And then our final level, we are calling Concierge Access. This is the level where you basically hire me as a consultant. I can help you plan a gaming event. I will help you curate your game collection. I can help you decide which games to add or maybe which games you should remove from, the, from your collection because you've got duplication. I can help you shop for games, whether for yourself or as a gift for another gamer. At this level, you can also select a specific game for me to do a detailed review on. Like, I'll do the whole shebang. I'll unbox it. I'll do all the, we'll take it out to local events. We'll play it a number of times. And we'll do a full review on the show. Like, you're going to hear in a minute about Imhotep. The only thing I won't guarantee is that I'll like the game. Along with these new tiers, we've added a couple of backer-based goals as well. All right, so 25 patrons. We hit 25 patrons. We're getting new lights. Like nice LED lights, fill the room kind of stuff to help improve our video quality. Uh, probably not much for this podcast, but for our actual plays and unboxings. If we hit 
75 patrons, it's time for a camera upgrade, allowing for multiple angles and better video and streaming quality. Now this may be buying a new camera or it might be buying a new laptop so we can handle two camera inputs. We're not sure yet. Once we hit 75, we'll figure it out, but we want at least two different views on our videos. Now at 100 patrons, I'm gonna start giving away some games. I'm gonna start passing on review copies of games after I posted the reviews online. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna only send you the worst of the worst. So I'm still thinking Tower of Madness might be the, the first because I might not have liked it, but enough other people seem to dig it. Now to get access to all of these, remember all you've gotta do is head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Up next, a review of Imhotep, Imhotep, a new dynasty, an expansion for Imhotep, builder of Egypt. Imhotep, a new dynasty was designed by Phil Walker Harding, which is the same designer as the original game. Features art from Miguel Coimbra, Martin Hoffman, Michaela Killing, and Klaus Steven. Produced in 2017 by Thames and Cosmos. This is another game where we've got an unboxing video up on YouTube, and you should all check that out so you can see what you get in the box. And for those of you who haven't seen it, what do you get in the A New Dynasty expansion for Imhotep? All right, one thing I want to point out, I almost should have it here for people on the stream to hold it up, is the ridiculous size of this box. It's like really long and tall and skinny. I have no idea why it's this size. It's, it's this big rectangle. It won't fit in the core box. And inside, the only thing that actually takes up the entire height is the instructions. Like the punch boards aren't that long. I, I don't know. It's kind of like the box insert, the original Imhotep. I, I don't get it. Uh, those instructions I mentioned, eight pages long, uh, actually seven pages of rules, one reference sheet. Well written, they're good. They're just as good as the original, color coded, which is cool. Uh, we actually have Meeple in here, which is just unique because the original game didn't have Meeple in it. Uh, there's a little yellow Imhotep and there's some chariots in the four different player colors. Now, does it fit when you unbox it? Does it fit into the original box? Yes, and you don't even have to remove the silly weird rectangular box insert. All so right. if they put out any more expansions, that box insert's probably gotta go. <laughs> Uh, next, you got punch boards. There's a bunch of punch boards. There's five of them. Most of them are the new player boards. That's a big part of this expansion. But there's a ton of little things to punch out in this expansion. Uh, like way more than the base game. There's chits and tokens, uh, stuff for gold, uh, scarabs, polyominoes, square numbered chits, like all kinds of stuff to punch out. So really, there's a lot more components in the game once yeah. you get this expansion. It's a very light game, generally. Yes, yeah, a ton of components. And we'll get to the, some of that in my final thoughts because that's actually one of my few complaints about this. Uh, then we have a deck of cards. Uh, there's seven new Prophecy of the Guards cards. Gods? Guards? I don't know, guards. Prophecy of the Guards. It's when they're standing outside. They No, Prophecy of the Egyptian God cards. 14 new market cards. And then some other cards that are required for the different boards. So again, more little extra bits. If it was Prophecy of the Greek card, Greek Gods, we'd really be weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be really odd. <laughs> It's All right. Well, at least things. at least the card stuff sounds familiar from my play of the game, from my play of the the base game. Yeah, the, the gods are new. That's that's yeah. one of the things. So what all these do is you got three new modules. This seems to be a thing with modules lately, where you don't just get a module, you get a bunch of things to choose from. And I, I it's a thing. I don't know if it's good or bad. I, I like it sometimes. Other times I'm like, I don't. In this case, it's fine. Uh, the new market cards are probably the easiest thing. So I'm going to start with those 14 cards. Mix them up with the rest. You're good to go. Uh, there's some neat new stuff in here. One of them is a cargo sled, lets you have more stones stored, which is huge in that game. Uh, the most powerful one, the one I think is the coolest and modifies the game the most, is uh, the raft, which lets you dock a boat where there's already a boat. Now, these sound handy. Can they just be left in no matter what? Even if you pull out all the other expansions, these can stay in and they don't mess the game up? Yeah, I, I, again, I would have got to that in final thoughts. But yeah, definitely. We're... There's no, I don't see a reason to pull these out. Like, I, I'll, even if I'm not using the expansion, the rest of the expansion, I just toss these in the box. What's nice, they even include additional um, statues. So you don't even throw off the, the ratio of statues. Statues are a card where you collect uh, sets of to score points. So they even include those. So it's not like adding these 14 cards dilutes the deck, which is oh, nice. cool. That is nice. Uh, Prophecy of the Gods cards. This adds a betting element to the game. Start of the game, you put three cards in play. Each lists some kind of requirement, and it's usually based on having something. So like the Prophecy of Ra, a player has to have at least four ornaments, which are the green cards. Uh, another example is Prophecy of Isis requires a player to have the most stone out of any player in the temple board. Now, on your turn now, you can spend one or two Scarab tokens you get to bet on these prophecies, saying, I'm going to have the most green cards, or I'm going to have the most stone in the temple. 
What's neat is if you're right, you get points at the end of the game, but if you're wrong, you lose points. Does sound uh, like a risky proposition. <laughs> uh, the final part is the new, is the biggest part is new boards. So there's five boards in Emotep that are A and B sided. This gives you five replacement boards, five more boards, also two sided C and D. Um, now, I don't want to go over what all the sides of the pie do, boards do, because that would take a long time and you can find out. And it's a bit much for this podcast, but I will highlight two of them just to kind of show you the differences. So the C side of the market is now known as the luxury market. It has the four market cards as usual, but there's symbols for golds in between each set of two cards. And that's to remind you, because at the start of the game, every player gets two gold coins, and two times during the game when they go to the market, they can spend one of the coins to take two adjacent cards instead of one. Is that adjacent in both directions, or just... Just not diagonally. Okay. So two next to each other. I okay. can't, I'm on yeah, podcast, yeah. so I can't show people. But yeah, it's not Orthogonally. Diagonally. Yes, orthogonally adjacent tiles. Uh, another one that I like is the D side of the pyramid. This one's called the corridor. This has a bunch of numbered squares and a ring that are victory points if you put a cube on them. You place the Imhotep meeple on the first square. And the neat part here is you always place your stone on the next path past Imhotep. But anytime someone goes to the quarry, they have the option to jump the Imhotep ahead to the start of the pile. So I thought that was really neat because now there's a reason to go to the quarry besides just getting more stone. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it sort of expands that... Uh that function and uh, yeah. makes it a little more powerful than just I need to refill so I can do something. Exactly. Yeah. It makes it a little more interesting. It gives you, it might give you a reason to go even when your sled's full, right? Like I like that. Um, I describe a few more of the boards over on the full review on the blog, but I'm going to leave some players, some of them for players to discover on their own. So even if you read this and listen to this and go to the blog, you won't get all of them. What's worth noting though. And I think this is really impressive is with these boards, there are now 10, or 1,028 possible board combinations you can play with Imhotep, which is, so, that, that's crazy. So you got an expansion, but you've definitely got a lot of uh, game pl replayability out of it. Oh, yeah. Like, like this This may be Sean Gilgore's, except it's an expansion. Sean Gilgore's question was a base game. Yeah, that's this what I mean. Close, you, you may have an expansion, nuts. but, man, do you get a lot of replay yeah. out of that one expansion. What sounds fun is someone on, on Board Game Geek has listed them all off and is crossing them off as they play them, so no oh, wow. game of Imhotep for them will ever be the same. Right. Because when are they well, going to play Unless they play 1,029 games? of them, and then they're yes, out of luck. I, by then, they're <laughs> out of luck. By then, maybe they'll put out another expansion. I don't know. It's cool. Uh, now, having played this, I played it a number of times with New Dynasty. I dig it overall. I, overall, it's good. But let's look at each part. Sean already mentioned this. We talked about it, basically. But the market cards, they're great. They add some interesting new twists. Uh, just throw them in. Use them every game. I'm going to use these every time. Now, Prophecy of the Gods, I feel a little different. To me, this is the weakest part of this expansion. Though I actually thought they were kind of neat and interesting. They reminded me a bit of Ticket to Ride. I had a lot of fun betting early because if you bet early, you have you the, the points are more. You either gain more or lose more, whereas you can bet later in the game and get less. I thought it was neat, but I played with a couple people that really disliked it. So in this case, I think this module is going to depend on your group. Like, try it out once with them. See if they like them. But even if the players don't, toss it back in the box so what, you lose seven cards. Based out of everything you get in this expansion, it doesn't even feel like you're losing out or anything. Now, when you say to uh, take to write, is this something that uh, each individual person gets a card to bet on, or are they set up at the no. top and everyone gets to bet on or choose who Everyone who bets gets on to bet on them. Yeah, everyone gets to bet on them. So there's three cards, and what it is, there's three levels at each. So if you bet in turn one or two, it's worth this many points. If you bet in turn three or four, it's worth this many points. If you bet in turn five or six, it's worth this many points. And multiple people can even bet on the same thing. So it's not like you're taking a spot. Oh, okay. So yeah, see, now that sounds less interesting to me. My first, when, I, when you first described it, my thought was you put up some cards at the beginning of the game, you look at the setup of the boards, and you bet, or you don't. The fact that no. you can keep betting throughout the rest of the game yeah. takes the interest away from me. Well, uh, you get you get the bet twice. You get two scarabs you can use. I, I think it would be interesting if you had to look at the boards, make your decision before you started. Yeah. And then I know, the either bet or don't. Thing here is you get almost nothing if you bet at the end. So, like, right. by the time you're in turn six, you're like, well, I'm going to have the most stone in the pyramid because <laughs> I've got the most stone in the pyramid. Ooh, you got two points out of it. Meanwhile... Right. D, who predicted it at the beginning, is like, I got seven points because I knew I was going to have the most stone somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. It's take it or leave it. Sounds like you'd be on the leave it side. Yeah. I liked them. I thought they were neat. I, 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 but I didn't think they were cool enough that I'm going to ask, like, no, no, I want to have them in. I don't care. I'll play with them or without. So that leaves the biggest part, the new boards. This is obviously the main reason to pick up this expansion, in my opinion. Uh, overall, I dig them. 
The thing, though, is these are definitely meant for experienced players. While none of them, I would say, are hard to understand how they work or the mechanics, but every single one of them is definitely more complicated than the A and B side cards in the base game. Now, this is true not only in how you set up the boards and how they work, but also the strategy and tactics required. Like, I, I would... and. I would say that you like never break this out with new players. The other thing that I think is a bit of a problem is I would consider many of these boards to be what I call fiddly. As, as Sean noted, the base game doesn't have much in it, right? There's stones, there's the, the boards, and there's some cards and boats. That's it. Like, that's all you got. Now you got chariot meeple and polyominoes and new player cards and wooden chits, and you got bingo things, and you got a board you stack between some of the stuff to make scaffolding and all this stuff. New Dynasty just has more stuff, more physical bits. So it takes more time to set up. It's more to track while you're playing, and it's more bits to clean up. Now, all that said, I'm not saying that ruins it. I still dig the new boards, but just realize that they're, like, they're almost a next step game. It's no longer the simple quick to set up, quick to teach, quick to play game. There's a little bit more involved. Stand by one sec. Sean is having problems with a UPS. It wasn't that loud on this. Place that battery soon. Or turn it off before we start recording. All right. Uh, I really got to do something about the battery. Uh, Remind you every week. Yeah, I know. (laughs) And it's only during the show. It doesn't go off any other time. Yeah, yeah, go off on Thursdays where no one cares. I know, right? All right. Uh, Do you need me to repeat anything or? No, no, we're good. Uh, All right. So I, what I find is, you know, the original game is simple. Uh, as NG Games says, it's a pub game. You know, yeah. it's really quick to set up. It's really easy to play. Learning it takes no time. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. I played Put it for the first time. Deliver a boat. Yeah. Here's what the different boards do. I Go. played it for the first time at uh, easy mode. And really, I mean, I, there was no teach. It was just, okay, let's just start playing, basically. Just go. Yeah. And uh, the game isn't that anymore when you add this expansion in. Um, there's a lot more to work out when you when you put those new boards out you've got to think about it you've got to look at it you've got to figure out and plan what you're going to do and how things are going to work because you can't just look at it and go oh that's that one that's that one great okay mm-hmm. um, oh i agree so it's, it's Plus, no it's longer a pub game it's it's not even for the physical components you're yeah. going to lose a polyomino or you're going to drop <laughs> a little chit that says 23 on it yeah. for the one board i like to call the whatever the bingo burial chamber because <laughs> that's it makes sense what you played in. Yeah, yeah. It's, no, I, I that's, it. <laughs> that board at our table is always going to be the bingo burial chamber. But overall, I, it's it's excellent. Um, I, it's close to, to say must-have. Uh, I'm very happy to have this in my collection. The only time I'm getting rid of this is if I get rid of Imhotep, and I don't expect that to happen soon. I personally think if you own Imhotep Builder in Egypt, I don't see a reason not to pick this up. Uh, except for the fact you may not be able to afford it. But, like, if you're out shopping for games and you're going to buy an expansion, you know, put this up there with Terraforming Mars and Prelude. Like, it, it's pretty much... It, it doesn't fix the game anyway. It's not a must-have, but you're not going to be disappointed. Excellent. For a more in-depth look at Imhotep Builder of Egypt, uh, check out... Mo, uh, sorry, that's the uh, expansion. Uh, Imhotep, a uh, new dynasty. Yes. Check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Review. And now, Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. The cool gaming stuff last week for me was actually two game nights. Saturday was a game night at the CG Realm local game store, FLGS. Uh, I signed up to actually do demo games of Azul Summer Pavilion. Uh, offered to teach the game because I've been playing it on the weekend before. I learned how to play the game pretty good, and I've been enjoying it. And that was, appropriately, the first game we played. Uh, so a four-player game, stuck to the default colored sides of the board. I still haven't tried the other side yet. Um, I did better. I like this game. I had fun because I don't know what it is. Like, when I first got Azul, and you can listen to the podcast when I got it, I loved it. And, like, I brought it to Origins, and I taught Wayne Humphrey, and we, we played with people there, and I actually used to do really good. And then somewhere, I just lost all ability at playing Azul, and I don't know what happened. Even when I played Summer Pavilion at Easy Mode last week, I did terrible. I don't know. Like, this week, I was great. I did awesome. I held my own. Like, I didn't win, but I was in, like, like I think I was two points away from first, so I came in a close second. I, I was happy about that. 
Well, you know, it's one of those games where uh, there's a there's a vibe, and it really depends on the makeup of the of the table too, and how yeah. everyone else is playing. Uh, you know, we've talked in the past about how uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, plays, yep. uh, and, and his style of playing. Uh, and I know, like my style was always, I don't know what I'm doing that well because I don't play it that often. <laughs> yeah. I understand the the game, but I haven't yeah. played it enough to develop strategy. So mm. I kind of wing it on a on a turn by turn basis. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Now it's worth noting, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, actually came in dead last. So he may not be quite the Azul master we thought after his last outing at with Summer Pavilion or the times we played Sintra with him. So well, it, it was finally proven that it's, because <laughs> I, I remember you saying, I'm like, I want to try that again without Sean at the table, which I thought was hilarious. He loves that. I told him that he, he was slain by that. So I don't know if he was having an off day or if we just played better this time. So Because well, his argument was when we played at easy mode, all he did was sit back and grab the biggest amount of tiles every turn with no real strategy, just I'm just going to take the most tiles I can have every turn. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes it's the exception that proves the rule. You can't be perfect yep. every time. It's true. <laughs> now, maybe uh, Deanna mentioned in the chat, he threw the game to put us off his scent. He is a <laughs> shark. He's, he's just waiting for us to put money on the game. That there might be it. All right, this one's a little weird. Um, not quite how I planned it, but despite the fact that Zool was the game of the night, people seem more interested in playing other games. It happens. We're doing a demo night. What we did have, though, is people watched us play that first game. So we set it up, and no one was there when we set up the game. So we're like, eh, might as well play a game of Azul, and then I'll do another one later. As people came in, they were really fascinated by the game. We had a crowd, uh, actually, and crowd that was asking questions, which was good. They didn't just sit and watch. They were like, so why'd you grab that? What, what do you get that for? Oh, so when you do that, you get bonus tiles? So that was cool. So basically, I did demo for a larger group than who played, which was nice. But as soon as that game ended, people went and did their own things. So there was a group playing Mountains of Madness, which actually looks really neat, where you're playing dwarves and delving into a mountain. And then um, Eric, who's a local gamer I hadn't seen out in a while. I don't know if he listens to this, but it was awesome to see you out, Eric. He had brought and taught Oceans, which is an updated version of Evolution. And I got to say, that looked neat, too. But I was a little busy at the time because we set up a five-player game of Terraforming Mars and finally got to try the Turmoil expansion. Now, no, I do have the Kickstarter version. So anything I say going forward pertains to the Kickstarter version, though I really don't think it impacts the specific stuff I'm going to be talking about. Yeah, it seems to me, uh, like, personally, I learned the new Azul by sitting and watching you guys play a game. Uh, mm. I came in, I'd finished up uh, the game I'd been playing earlier. Uh, and came over and sat and watched you guys finish the game, and that's how I learned how to play the game. I mean, I think I think I had a couple of questions when I sat down, but generally it was you you sit and you watch and you ask a couple of questions. Hey, yep. you know, oh or, oh, are the totems that? Or, oh, the windows are that? Oh, okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Great. Um, and that that was how I learned to play the game because it really is that easy to pick up if you've played yep. Azul of any of the Azuls before. But I think one of the reasons that players may have drifted is this is the third Azul in mm -hmm. three years. Yep. It's great, but some people just don't want to lay tile all the time. <laughs> no, it's true. But I got the very obvious question by a couple local gamers. Mo, is it worth picking up? And that's all they needed, right? That yep. happens. So that was a couple people came over. They took a look at it, said, looks good, and literally asked questions. Is that worth picking up? And I will say my answer was yes. Though with the caveat, I've only played twice. So yeah. <laughs> at this point, yes. More than Sintra. Yes. Oh, no, <laughs> definitely. I Sorry, uh, Next Move Games. Sintra's falling down the stairs. They're, it's going down. All right. Um, Terraforming Mars. After a bit of a debate, uh, we decided to include Prelude as well as Turmoil, but we pulled everything else out. Uh, one of the reasons for that, we did have one new player, which, man, I feel kind of bad for throwing him in with Turmoil the first time, but dude really wanted to try the game, so I'm like, you'll dig it. And I, I, I told him. He, he was passing me his cards. I was helping him. It worked. But even doing that, so we throw in Prelude, and we're playing with all experienced players who play many times. So you got me, Deanna, Paul, and Sean Hamilton. We've all played 20, 30, 40 games of Terraforming Mars. Together, even. Like, I play with Paul all the time. He, he loves that game. And then this new guy. It took us uh, till five minutes till after the store closed. Yeah, you, you have a, a bad habit of teaching new players Terraforming Mars yeah. at less than ideal times. It, it definitely um, happens. And I, to be honest, I don't think I would have felt comfortable doing a late in the evening game of Turmoil because while I have played Terraforming Mars a number of times and I feel comfortable, I don't know the cards well yeah. enough. And again, and it's a game where, you know, system mastery helps, 
knowing those cards can really accelerate a game massively. Yeah, no, I agree. Because, like, I'm going to guess have four hours, probably more, maybe four and a half. Now, we did have a new player. And like you said, the biggest thing, though, was first time using the expansion, which had some new kind of funky rules. Like, we had the rule book out. That doesn't happen often. Where I, like, I kept it out and yeah. referred to it multiple times. Uh, but it was having to read the new cards. There are a lot of new cards in Turmoil. A lot. It's it's not a small stack. And I got to say, even though, like, with those caveats, one of the things I've heard about Turmoil is it makes the game longer. That seems to be definitely true. So for those who don't know, I don't. I know we're not gonna we're not gonna really delve into it, but it's politics of terraforming Mars, correct? Yeah, yeah it's uh, Deep Mocker meets Tele terraforming Mars. You, there are different political parties. Every turn, you have a free delegate you can send to one of the political parties. The party that's in charge is going to put an overall effect in play for the next coming generation. Those are generally good, and then at the end of the round. After you've generated resources, this whole new phase happens. So besides there being this government, there's also events. And the events actually had way more of an impact on the game than the, the, the politics. Then after you've done the event, you then figure out which power is in charge. And then they take over and you everyone gets a bonus based on which party's in charge or penalty. Because like one of the parties are the, the Mars reformers who don't want you to terraform it and charge you money for every terraforming you do. So there's some interesting stuff going on. There's there's a lot of stuff going on with that game. Um, now, again, this is my first play, so I don't want to say too much. It's going to take more plays before I get my final thoughts. Uh, but when we played, and I know this isn't the case for everyone, talking to people on Twitter, was it ever punishing? So one of the things that happens is at the start of the event phase, you all lose one terraforming rating, which I thought was amusingly thematic because it's the terraforming board Decides we've seen it all before. We're we're not impressed by what you've been doing lately. It's it's all about what sorry, it's all about what you're doing lately, not what you've done in the past. Right. And they're not so impressed with that project you did three turns ago. And that's what this is supposed to represent. That really reduces the overall final score and how much money you get, because your terraforming rating is tied to how many mega credits you get. Then we had a string of four or five generations in a row where the events cost us all money. So what actually happened was every turn going forward. We lost money. We made less and less and less money, which is pretty much the opposite of what you expect to do in an engine builder. Now, I wouldn't say it's bad. It, it wasn't like it was terrible. It happened to all of us. It wasn't unfair. We all had to deal with the same situation, but it was definitely interesting. And it showed off how much turmoil can change the feel and flow of the game. I'm really looking forward to a totally different play on the opposite side of the coin where I'm sure it'll happen sometime where you get a bunch of positive events at the beginning and it means you can do all kinds of stuff. Okay. So Venus Next is still the least enjoyed expansion to date then, right? Yeah, definitely. At this point, I would easily say Turmoil is better, better received than Venus Next. Uh, of the five people playing Saturday... Uh, no one minded the expansion. Like, that sounds barely positive, but I don't, I don't mean it that harshly. Uh, no one was like, oh, I love it, it's awesome, either. So, But when we played Venus, there were definitely players like, ooh, I did not enjoy that. We didn't have that at all. So no one was like, oh, terrible, Turmoil's horrible. But we didn't have anyone like, oh, that was fantastic, best game of Terraforming Mars yet. Right. So with a lot more. We played once. Like, come on, I can't say that much. Maybe everything I just said wrong. Well, I tried to frame it because, really, we got punished, and it was interesting. Uh, the other game for me, night for me, is... Oh my God, we played on Monday night. It actually happened. We actually got together on a Monday. It was only three of us, but hey, it was a Monday game group. First game we played on Monday was Gorinto with three players. This is the game I've been doing. Um, I've been playing the preview copy from Grand Gamers Guild. Um, this time I decided to try out some optional rules. We tried the wave pattern for tile setup, which was really ironic. Someone pointed out on Instagram that we did the tile pattern and our end game scoring was water and wind. So I thought that was kind of funny. It wasn't planned. And we used the dragon tiles for the first time. So when you're when you're saying wind uh the wind tile, does that mean so rather than the rather than the mountain, the layout yes. is, is more So it was three tiles, two tiles, three tiles, two tiles, three tiles. Oh, okay. And and there are four different variants in the back of the book and it says feel free to try others. Oh interesting. Okay. Because there's one where it's it's higher on the edges instead of the middle. Right. Which does change things. Like oh, there, there were definitely differences absolutely. on how we and we ended up with the most empty board we've ever had. Like there were definitely holes by the by the end of it. Yep. Um game went good. Uh I I'm digging it. I am really liking this game. 
I haven't played, I've facilitated people playing this game more than I played it now. So I need to sit down and play some more myself. Um, I dug the new pattern. Uh, it Again, it changed it, but not, it still, it was Torrento. Like it didn't, didn't change the feel. It wasn't like, oh, now that we're playing with waves, drafting, <laughs> hate drafting is more important. No, it was still the same game. The Dragon Piles, I actually expected to be really overpowerful. Like reading the rules for those, right? Mark sent me the rules. I just thought it was going to be like, whoever's first player is going to grab the dragon token and dominate because of that. And it wasn't nearly as powerful as I thought. One of the things I hadn't thought of is that if you're putting out a dragon tile, that now ends up in the mountain, which means the next player can take it, which I'm like, oh, that's cool. I hadn't thought of that flow of play. Though once one was already out there on the board, I thought they might be powerful, but even in our game, there's a dragon tile sitting there and people went and did other things. And eventually it got taken, but it wasn't like the race to the dragon tile. So that was cool. I did. I didn't appreciate that ep that addition to the game. Yeah, no, I still. Uh, I'm hoping. Hopefully, when I get down uh, uh, next time, I can get a chance to play it a two player. I'd like to. I'd like to. See Fortunately, it not. By nope. then, it'll be long gone to another reviewer. Oh, all right. You're, you're gonna have to wait. He actually asked me to ship it out today, and I said I'd like to keep it for one more weekend. So I have it this weekend, but I am not gonna have it by next weekend. All right. I've got to pass uh, I it forgot, on. This. I forgot that was a pass along. Yeah, yep. this is this is one. There is only one prototype copy in Canada, and we're kind of circling it around. Yep. Uh, personally, yeah, I'm going to try to play this weekend. Um, then I got to send it to another reviewer. And I got to say, I'm sad to see it go. Like, I, can I just keep this till I get a production copy? I don't even remember what I agreed to with. I, I think I'm getting a production copy out of this. I don't remember what I agreed to with Mark to even review this. But if I'm not, I might back the Kickstarter. I, I might dip into the, the, the fund somewhere to get a copy of this because... I'm really enjoying what I've seen so far. Hmm. Now, February 5th, that's that's one week from today. Next, our next podcast recording, I will give our official featured review, get to hear all about it, get to hear about the well, the components we have. Uh, there's no unboxing for this because it's prototype. That'll be the final word, my final word on Garinto. Unless something horrible happens this Saturday or this weekend when I play it, I can't see it being negative in any way. Now, one of the things I love about gaming with Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, not that I don't love playing games with Sean from Hamilton. Okay, I feel like I have a shovel here and I'm digging. Uh, Sean Hamilton loves, or is always up for trying something new. I, I don't know if he loves trying something new, but he's always up for it. He's always up for helping me reduce the pile of shame. And that's often what we do. If he's the only person that can show up on a Monday night, we'll start digging through, uh, digging through my piles. Uh, to that end, the next game I broke out Monday was Gorus Maximus. Uh, this is a trick-taking game with a bloody gladiator theme, an over-the-top bloody gladiator theme. And that's the thing that sticks out the most when you first see this game. We did do an unboxing of this. You can see it. Uh, while the cards are cartoony, they are covered in over-the-top gore and violence. Uh, something I guess the name fits. Like, it fits. It's called Gorus Maximus. But that's going to turn some people off. Yeah, I, I remember when we when we when I watched the unboxing of this, it was very obviously a wow. This they yeah. they, I mean Maximus. Yeah, they, and they, again, they're upfront about it. They say it in the title, but you still might not expect the level of art you're yeah. getting from the title. Thankfully, it's not realistic. It's cartoon comic book, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like like I think the three hundred. That's probably a good reference to this. Though more cartoony, not that style, but just the over the top. So ignoring that, uh, the art and the theme, what we have is a really solid trick taking game that surprised me. Can be played one to eight players, which man, that's a nice range for a trick taking game. Now, some of the things that make this game unique from other card games is every card is used every round. So you kind of have perfect information. Like obviously it's random because everyone's getting different cards. Um, but it's great. Like if anyone's a card counter, they're going to love this game. One of the things I noted while playing is my mom and dad would love this back in the day. So my mom would have been really turned off by the art. Uh, the other thing that's neat is you can change Trump mid hand. I sure there are card games out there that do that, but I thought it was rather interesting. Uh, you do it in a very Uno kind of way where if you match the number of the card just played, you change the suit. So that's like, so I have seen it in Uno obviously, but that's, that's a, a very different kind of game. That's not a trick taking game. And the fact that different cards are worth different points and some are negative. So that's kind of like the spades thing or the hearts, sorry, the hearts thing where the hearts are negative. Uh, so you don't want to win every trick. So that's not it. Like if you win all the tricks, you're probably going to get negative points. And there's some tricks you want to win and some you don't. So there's that whole play of I want to play low so that you get it, you know, that interplay. Now at this point, same deal uh, with Turmoil. I've only played once. So I'll be saving a more detailed explanation and final thoughts for the later. 
I got to say, for a trick-taking game, it was pretty solid. It was cool to see some new things done or at least comboed in an interesting way on what's really an ancient style of card game, right? Like trick-taking games have been around forever. I personally, though, wish that art was less extreme so, you know, I could play with, like, like little G. I'm yeah. not going to be breaking this game out with my kids. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a way to do cartoon gore and make it gory but still cartoony <sighs> enough that it's not yeah. it's not something that you're actually shocked by. Whereas I think this this one drifts into the shocking level. I and, and yeah. you know again it's a choice, but it was it was uh, it was a choice that limits their market. So. I got it. There's gonna be people that love it. They're they're gonna be the same people who probably bait back the hate Kickstarter, and they love the fact that they can be cannibals and eat their enemies for victory points. Whatever people are into that kind of stuff, that's fine. That's your thing. This is my thing. I just like it's a trick taking game. I want to play card games with the family. This that's is true. not a family game because of the art. Yeah, they call it 13 plus. Uh, oddly, the community says eight plus. I'm not sure well, who the community's got. Well, eight, eight plus old. for mechanics. Yeah, but strategy, I wouldn't but want yeah. to be showing my eight year old some of these. Uh... Yeah, definitely not for me. I don't know. Uh, different people have different sensibilities. Yep, Just, absolutely. It, it's worth noting. Listen to our episode on problematic content for <laughs> more of our, our views on what we think about games with interesting themes. Absolutely. Uh, final game of the week, of course, is Imhotep, a new dynasty. Uh, we did a three-player game. We used all CD sides so I could try out the final boards I hadn't played with before. Uh, this was Deanna's first time seeing it, and I was pleased to see she enjoyed it as much as I have been through my plays of it. Uh, I talked enough about Imhotep during the review segment, so I don't think it's worth going into here. But I will say a great time was had with it on Monday, playing three players. Uh, Sean Hamilton, in particular, we had played two-player. Some of those boards play much better with more than two player, is all I'll say. Sure. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, this weekend, I don't even know. I need to get some more Garinto in, or I want to both, actually. I want to I want and need to get more Garinto in. Uh, I also want to really push to get extermination for Ryzen's played. I ended up breaking that out after we played uh I, blah, 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 imhotep after we played imhotep and i was trying to convince it like hey let's play a three-player game of this we didn't get out and i looked at the cards and i learned something neat about it so not only is there a new race that's all about pvp and interacting that new race doesn't get its own deck instead it's split over the other five decks and i thought that was fascinating so now you're getting a, a pvp card in all the decks whereas I, I in my head was picturing well if you want the extermination cards you can get them and you have to go to this pile so I thought that was cool that it's spread out. Plus, there was some other stuff in there that looks neat. There's, it's another one where there's three modules, and you can choose to use which ones you want. So I want to get that one out. I, and plus, I feel a little overdue. Levi was awesome enough to send a copy, and that was, at this point, quite a while ago. So I kind of feel we owe it to him. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, due to the time-shifting nature of things, I'll be talking about uh, playing some Minecraft uh, Builders and Biomes with my kids. There you go. See, at this point, I don't do that anymore. When I, when I used to produce the, the weekly blog post, I did that now. I'm like, no, if I played it yesterday, I'll talk about it on today's show. I'm talking about stuff I played this Monday. I gave up. I'm trying to do that. I'm going to hold it off on a week, and next week we'll be talking about we this had game. Enough, we had enough played. content that I wasn't going to drop it in. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Uh, the week after that, Sean from Hamilton will be Sean from Hamilton in Windsor. And we've got a game of Big Trouble in Little China, Legacy of Lopan, to finish up. Uh, I invited Sean Hamilton to join us if he wants, so because we have we can throw in a sixth player. Absolutely. I don't see why not. Although I didn't wasn't thinking about the fact that he won't be leveled up, but we can probably just look at our average level and throw him in. Uh, in addition, CG Realm game night on Saturday. Uh, this is in February. We don't plan that far ahead all the time. I don't know what we're playing. I don't know if there's a scheduled game. There'll be a scheduled game of something. We'll be doing demos of something, and I'll be bringing some games to play. I don't know what. But we will be there. Uh, Sean should be there for that, too. We'll be getting there at 5 p.m. If you want to play some games with us, head on down to the CG Realm. Now, a quick shout-out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Misdirected Mark. Uh, generally on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, but they're taking a uh, short break, and uh, we'll be announcing when they're going to get back on the, uh, on the Twitch. Blood Boiler, thank you. Evil John, thanks, John. Wade Humphrey, all right, you keep asking me about Abaddon. Put it this way, it's another Han Solo the card game. Roger Malosh, thanks for letting me check out your game mechanic when I was last at Windsor. And a big welcome to our latest patron, Zopi. Well, that was the double bell. 
that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube every Tuesday at 2 a.m. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around to join us in the penthouse suite for the after show where we've got a box to crack open. For Tabletop yeah, Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, and game on. on.